So the book of Acts, Kingdom Perspectives, Wednesday night. Man, I'm, I'm enjoying this teaching. I'm hoping that it's, it's reaching you and blessing you. But here's some of the things we said last time as we review. I said, Satan has a plan to take you out, but the Father has a plan to keep you in. Amen. Anytime you get a bad report, you go through something, you just remind the devil of who Jesus is. You remind the devil, you remind the doctor, you remind everybody around you what the word of God says. Amen. Because that's the plan that we're going to stand on. I'm not saying those things aren't real that are going on in your life. I'm just telling you to speak the word and watch Jesus move. Amen. I talked about this. I said, who you were before, in, uh, before Christ is a template of what you will do for Christ. Remember me saying that. It's a template. In other words, when you get saved, God doesn't suck your brains out. Some churches, some churches, I wonder, they get saved and they get their brain sucked out. They get their personality sucked out, you know, and all of a sudden they become a prune, they become a lemon. And, you know, there's not much you can do with those two, I guess, except make juices out of them. But, uh, you know, God wants to use your passion for life and your passion of your past for the kingdom of God. Amen. You should, in fact, I believe that if you were wild in your younger days, uh, you know, even if you never did anything wrong, just the youth of your life, I believe that when Christ touches you and touches your natural with his super, you become supernatural and you become on fire and the Bible says the path of the, of the righteous grows dimmer and dimmer. No, it don't. It grows brighter and brighter. Then how come we become more pruny and more lemony? I'm just, I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna stand right here. How come that is in church? Tell me why. I don't, I, don't, I don't get it. And I promise you that won't happen to me. I'm going to continue to stay on fire no matter what's going on. Why? Because greater is he that's in me than he that's in this world. And I ain't going back to the old junk. I don't want to go back to who I used to be. All right. Let, let me move on. So uh, that's the template, man. The power of prayer. The power of prayer can make the dirtiest sinner or convert the dirtiest sinner or reach the dirtiest center, sinner and open the hardest of hearts. The power of prayer. Doesn't matter who they are. Don't matter how far gone they are. I don't know. It doesn't matter anything about them. I remember when I first got saved, the Lord had me put a list together of, of singers and music, uh, movie stars and, and different people. I used to pray over specific people. Uh, I just felt led to do that. Felt drawn by the Holy Spirit to do that. Amen. So nobody's lost. I mean, if they're, you know, forever, we can declare and decree them saved. Many times we look at them and their drug addictions and their sexual ex page and all the things they do. And we say, well, they're lost forever. Why don't we pray for them? Maybe, maybe there's an opportunity. We never know. We have to declare that and decree it, okay? So the power of prayer can reach the dirtiest sinner. He reached you. Amen. Don't look at anybody else. He reached you, right? All right, the Apostle Paul, Apostle Paul is one of the best examples that prayer works. It's one of the best examples uh, that I have found in the, in, in the Bible. Of course, there's other people that have uh, lived dirtier lives or what have you, but the Apostle Paul, what a great example of that prayers can reach people and that prayers work. We talked about that Acts chapter 9. Uh, remember the breath, Greek phrase for panting. He was hell-bent. Here's Paul, man. He's, uh, he's, he's anointed of the, of the devil to go out and destroy the Christians to try to stop the way, which was the church title at the time, the title of Christians and disciples. And he was, he was going out, man. He was going to destroy them. And I believe that he, he would have done a pretty good job in Damascus where he was headed. But then verse 2 talks about the desire to crave, to beg, talked about the, the uh, uh, desire that he had. He wanted those letters. You could just see him. You know, he only had so much authority, but he needed the high priest. He needed those people in higher positions to give him that letters. So you could just see him chomping at the bit like, come on, man, let me go. I'm ready to tear somebody up. I'm ready to, I'm ready to do this thing. And this is what Paul was, was all about. Verse 3 
Remember the old song, I Saw the Light? <laughs> what was that was Hank Williams, wasn't it? He saw the light. I don't know if he did or not. Uh, they say he did at his deathbed, but I don't know. Uh, anyways, he saw the light. He saw the Lord, Lord Jesus. He was taken down. He was knocked down from his prideful position. Okay? So we talked about that, and we went into uh, verse 6. Get up and go, and you'll know. Get up and go, and you'll know. So God began to send Paul forward. Again, his name was, was Saul, and he, he's coming into his conversion. Uh, verse 7, hearing but not seeing. Remember, that's a powerful truth. There were people around that they heard, but they didn't see. A lot of people in church hear things, but they don't see it. You can be in a service like this, and, you know, it just go over one head, and then someone else goes, yeah, I got it. Oh, I saw something I've never seen before. Not necessarily the person didn't want to receive it. It's just some things hit you different than other people. You've been in services like that. I mean, 99% of the stuff, you listen, you write notes. Okay, that's cool. But then that one thing just right between your heart and your eyeballs, and you go, yeah, that's, that's what I needed to hear. So uh, some people are, are like that. Other people just receive it all. So uh, they, 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 they were there, but they didn't understand this truth. So they were blinded. Paul was blinded. It was brought low. He was humbled, man. He saw the light and he was humbled. You know, some people need a drastic uh, uh, conversion or inter- uh, interception, if you will, in their life because they have a great call on their lives. Amen. And, uh, it, and again, it doesn't matter. We don't compare ourselves with other people, how they were called, if they're preachers, if they're not preachers, if they had this issue in life. Or, it doesn't make a difference. The blood of Jesus makes us clean. Being called, being a child of God, being chosen by him makes us a disciple, makes us a, a son or daughter of God. That's all that matters. My name is written in the Lamb's book of life. If you surpass me or she surpasses you or that person does better than you seemingly in the kingdom at the end of the day, as long as you're doing what you're supposed to do, it doesn't matter. There's only one keeping score and that's your heavenly father, amen? And he just keeping score on whether you're faithful of what you're supposed to do. All right, so verse nine, three days represents what? Resurrection. Verse 10, we talked about that, extreme excitement. Uh, there was extreme caution. There was extreme anointing. Those the verses go on. And then uh, verse 15, great things he will suffer. And what I tell you, I said, Paul did much against that name, but now much will be done to Paul for that name. We're about to find out, okay? So, uh, to whom uh, much is forgiven, much is required. Isn't that right? That's why a lot of times we wonder why we go through, th- through, uh, through certain things and struggles and we're like, man, why, why? It, all, it seems like the devil's picking on me and God's picking on me. I'm, I'm probably the only one admitting that. You ever felt that way where it just felt like the devil, you're, you're on speed dial and the, you're the only name in the Rolodex and then you wonder what God's up to because you're going through stuff You know, uh, he's just allowing you to go through the trials and tribulations in order to form you into what you're supposed to be and what he's trying to make you into. It's called discipleship, okay? The enemy you rebuke, God, you just say, okay, work on me, keep working. You'll, You'll get me where you want me to be. All right, kingdom perspectives for tonight, the book of Acts. I think this is number 32, something like that, I don't know. 34, praise God. 1,899 more, and we'll be done. I'm loving it. Okay, here's a couple statements to walk upon. The calling of God on your life must be accepted by you, pursued by you, and protected by you. The calling of God on your life must be accepted by you. Let's hit that first. It must be accepted by you. You know, there's a lot of people that are called that never heed the call. I've heard it many times. In fact, one story is Catherine Kuhlman. When Catherine Kuhlman was called into the miracle healing ministry and preaching ministry, she asked the Lord, why me? I'm tall, I'm skinny, I'm ugly, I'm a woman. She said that she was, if you, if you remember some of y'all were back in my ISM class about the heroes of faith, she struggled with that. And the Lord spoke to her and said, I asked a man to do it, but he wouldn't do it. So I picked you. Pretty powerful. Catherine Coleman, one of the, one of the great healing revivalists and evangelists of, of that hour. 
uh, ministry is still doing things today through uh, uh, CDs and DVDs and what have you. An amazing thing. Uh, so the calling of God must be accepted by you. You and I have to say, okay, Father, I accept this call. Now we're getting into the life of Paul here so it all will fit together. Then what's next? It must be pursued by you. You have to pursue the calling of God. You have to go after the calling of God. If we look at Paul later on and if we study him in deeper detail, Paul was like, I'm pursuing the reason why I was pursued. I'm after you for the reason you knocked me down and blinded me. I was doing what I wanted to do, but you apprehended me. I'm in pursuit of the reason and the person who did that. That's what we should be doing in our Christianity. I'm after the one who saved me from a life of sin. I'm after that one. So I must pursue the calling. And then finally, I must protect the calling of God. It is my responsibility and it is your responsibility to protect the calling of God. I'm not just talking about preachers and guys that stand up or girls that sing or they play on the keyboard or drums. I'm not talking about people who you see. Every one of us has a calling. We have to protect our calling. Your calling, it doesn't have to be a five-fold ministry office. It can just be serving the Lord the best you possibly can. Well, guess what? If you stay clean and holy to, to the calling, the higher calling in God, and you do and you do, then we end up having a purer church. We have more pure people, and we become more powerful. Remember, purity is power with God. And then there's fresh anointing, because God doesn't anoint junk. He doesn't anoint mess. He doesn't anoint sin. Now, how come some guy can get up there and still be talented? Well, that's a familiar spirit. And most churches don't even know the guy or the girl is operating in a familiar spirit and they think it's the anointing because they have no discernment. That's pretty good preaching for Wednesday night. So you, you have to protect the calling. And, and, and then here's, an, here's two additions to this particular statement. The father will perfect the rest. The father will perfect the rest. Watch it again. The calling of God in your life must be accepted by you, pursued by you, and protected by you. The Father will perfect the rest. So I don't have to worry about my future. As long as I stay clean, as long as I stay in the word, as long as I stay connected to God, and I stay in his presence and holiness and righteousness and the word, he'll perfect the rest that's in my life. Even the stuff I'm working on and the stuff you're working on, those rough edges and those things he's trying to use a dremel on. But a saw, some of y'all, he's using a saw blade. But whatever he's doing, he's going to get those things rounded out. He's going to fix us. He's going to sand us down. Then here's the, the other statement that finishes, long statement. There are no automatics in the kingdom. There are no automatics in the kingdom when it comes to your calling, when it comes to your walk. Here's what I mean by that. You don't get saved and poof, you're Billy Graham. Poof, you're this person or that person. Poof, you know, all of a sudden you're winning thousands of souls. Poof, you're the greatest musician to ever walk the planet in your mind. Uh, whatever it is, it is, a, it is a process. Again, I have to pursue it. I have to, uh, I have to uh, protect it. I have to do everything that I need to do on my side as I pursue this call and accept this call. God perf perfects everything else, but there's no automatics. And I think what we've done in the body of Christ, and I'm going to get to the total teaching, you'll see it all sandwiched together here, but I think what we've done is an injustice and a disservice to discipleship as we tell people, all you got to do is come down and get saved, do a couple Bible classes, and boom, you're it. There you go. You're ready. It, there's no automatics. There's, there's, a, there, there's a continuous discipleship. You have to continue to walk this thing out. I don't care how old you are or where you are in life. You have to do that, okay? Here's my second statement. Paul received his sight and his mission and he never looked back. Paul received his sight and his mission and he never looked back. That has to do with the first statement. It mixes in with it. Paul received his sight, boom. He got physical sight, he received spiritual sight and he never looked back. Paul had a lot to look back to. Again, if I ever teach on the Apostle Paul, it is a phenomenal teaching uh, I could teach weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks on one person uh, because of the, the great call that God gave him. And he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. That's pretty good, pretty good calling. But he had a great calling outside of Christianity in the realm of being possibly the, the next high priest. That's how much Paul was in line and what he was learning. 
But aren't you glad he got knocked down and blinded and he accepted the call? Or we wouldn't have this truth, at least not through Paul. So we must pursue, watch this, we must pursue what is before us. We must pursue what is before us with such hunger and passion. We must pursue what is before us with such hunger and passion that nothing could ever drag us back. We'll try that one more time. We must pursue what is before us with such hunger and passion that nothing could ever draw, drag us back. Nothing. I'm too far gone now, ain't you? I'm too far gone. I know too much now. I've seen too much. I've, I've felt too much. I've, I, I, I've, I've tasted too much of the heavenly things of God to go back now. You're not dragging me back. I don't care who she is. I don't who care who they are. I don't care what's going on. I don't care how much money you got in that bag, how much gold you have on that scale. It doesn't make a difference to me how many people are in the building, how many assets you have connected to that. It doesn't matter. I'm not going back. I'm staying right where I am. Well, how do you do that? You must pursue that which is before us with such hunger and passion. You see, when people backslide, when people run out, from God and they don't do what they're supposed to do, they get their feelings hurt, they do whatever, it's because they have not put an investment into the kingdom of God and their relationship to the depth that nothing can shipwreck you. Does that make sense? There's nothing anybody can say in this room or watching right now that would ever pull me away from what God has called me to do or my relationship with him. But how many all know you have friends and family that one little wind of adversity comes and boosh, you don't see them anymore. It's, they've got an issue, what have you, what have you. And, and that is not a sign of strength. That is a sign of weakness. Is that right? So we must pursue. We must have hunger and passion to where we say to ourselves, I'm not giving up. I'm not giving in to anything that would try to distract me from what God has called me to do. Very powerful truth. So let's put this all together. Acts chapter nine. Acts chapter nine. Go to verse, uh, let's see, verse 18. And I hate to see that because I've seen it over the years. And, uh, you know, you have friends and family and, and, and people that you know that, man, they just, just couldn't hang on to what God was doing in their lives. And, and it's a sad thing uh, to see that. You ready? Verse 18. Okay, and immediately there fell from his eyes as had been scales and he received his sight forthwith is that right? And arose and was baptized. So immediately it took place. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. And then was Saul certain days with the disciples, which were at Damascus. So Paul begins to see immediately. And then he says, it's time to eat. Is that what he said? He basically, it's time to eat. I don't blame him. Three day fast is a pretty, pretty long time, isn't it? And so straightway, or excuse me, and he received his meat and he was strengthened. And then he was with Saul was, uh, certain days with the disciples, which were at Damascus. So here he is hanging out just for a little while. But I want you to notice something. Paul wasn't there to get preaching tips. Paul wasn't there to get instruction. Paul was there to be strengthened. And then Paul made his move. How do we know that? Galatians chapter 1 12 and 16. I don't have time to do, read that right now because I'm already a little behind, but Galatians 1, 12 and 16. Go back and read that because you see parallels between Paul's life in the book of Acts and then Galatians. He talks about it. Luke describes it as a historian and a writer. Paul begins to tell you from his experience. He puts more details in there, okay? So, so that's, that's the cool thing about seeing Paul's life. It's such an open book. So he basically, he didn't, he didn't sit there uh, basically to hang out to learn from them. How do we know this? Because Paul, he didn't confide with the disciples or the apostles for opinion. We'll talk about more of that more in just a minute, what, what he did. He pursued his call, didn't he? Okay? So he, he, he was there. I believe Paul was there for just a little bit of fellowship. I believe Paul was on fire. Uh, but again, I don't believe Paul sat there and wanted to hear from them because Paul already had a burning desire within him. 
He already had that. Remember the template about your past? I believe that when Paul got saved, the same fire, which was of the enemy, a zeal of murder, turned into the zeal of the Holy Ghost, and Paul just was fanatical. He was radical. And he would be what I call the original Jesus freak. Some of y'all remember the Jesus freak. I mean, he was a Jesus freak. He was a barbarian. He was like, man, I'm ready to do this thing. So I think that's another reason why he didn't hang out long. I didn't see Paul uh, being one who, who basically sat at a lot of people's feet. I saw Paul as, as a mover and a shaker and a mighty man of God. Don't you? Okay, so that explains a little bit what's happening, but I wanted to put that in there and, and show you again about us. I mean, if we were motivated before, before Christ, if we were innovative, if we were uh, whatever, you know, some people were good salesmen, some people were whatever, and, and, and God doesn't just take that away from you. He actually adds to that and anoints you to be better in his kingdom than you were for the devil, but again, I see it in church where we just, we, we lose. We, all of a sudden, we're just ready for heaven. It's almost like we're branded and stamped and tattooed and like an assembly line. Next, get them out of here. You know, and, it, and it's, a, uh, it's a shame to see that. That's why if you keep the passion and the hunger and all that inside of you and, and the fervency and the fever, if you will, maybe that's not a good analogy, but the desire, the, the burning zeal, uh, things won't bother you as much. And you won't go back. You won't shrink back into uh, despair, depression, emotional, blah, blah, blah. The things we all deal with. Amen. Verse 20, especially men. Verse 20, some ladies say, you know, uh, I know some emotional men. Verse 20. And straightway. When? When is straightway? Straightway is absolutely right now, immediately. Paul didn't go hang out anywhere. He straightway, he immediately went into ministry. He immediately went to do what he was called to do. And what did he do? He preached Christ. I love this. Paul's on fire, man. Paul is hungry. Paul, he, and this is the thing I want you to see. Paul was ready to kill these people. He was ready to kill them. He had already done the deeds, but he was ready. He was, all he needed was a little bit of authority. He was looking for the most wanted sign from the sheriff. And he was going to paste it all over Damascus and all over the synagogues. And he was going to start taking people to jail. But now all of a sudden he's preaching Christ. What a tremendous, tremendous conversion this was. This is what, and I don't want to belittle anybody's conversion or my conversion or anything. Uh, I know this was extreme. This was huge. But, but even, even if we just took a little bit of this understanding that when we get saved, how great a salvation it is, how great a conversion it is, because once you were lost, but now you're found. Once you were blind, but now you see. You were dead, now you're alive. It didn't have to be sky busting wide open and Jesus speaking to you and you're blinded. It's the fact that your heart was, the love of God was shed abroad in it. There's the light right there. And you were born again and I was born again. Man, I love that. And then Paul, man, he goes to preach Christ in the synagogues. Now watch this, that he is the son of God. Now let's, let's look at this a few things historically and, and, and make it into practical revelation for us. Paul went to Damascus, is that right? He went to the same synagogue that he was supposed to kill the people at. He went to the same synagogue, the same region that he watched Stephen be stoned. He literally went back to the scene of the crime. He was a compolis. Was he not? Was he a part of it? Yes, he held the jackets and he said, yeah, bravo, kill him. He was there, he consented. So just in this little short period of time, he's converted, he's on fire for God, and he's going right back to the scene of the crime, he's going right back to Damascus, and he's going to the synagogue that he had the most wanted posters in his hands. Now, you know, I'm just adding that in there to give you a little imagination to understand, but he had those, he's one of those letters, give them to me, I'll go get them. 
Don't you find that amazing conversion, an amazing example of going from that type of fervency, being that rabid, if you will, wanting to see people's lives and a whole sect, a whole religion, a whole cult in his mind destroyed, but now he found Christ and he preached to them. But notice what he said. He said, watch, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogue, and this is Luke, saying what? That he is the son of God. This is the first time in the book of Acts that the Son of God is mentioned, and it was mentioned by Paul. Now, you'll find it again in Acts 3.37, but most translations omit that. That's a part of the original canon, but some scholars put it in there whenever Philip was talking to the eunuch and said, hey, you know, uh, this is how you get saved, and he mentioned that to him. But really, in, in the transcripts or trans, translation, it's not there. They acquaint this right here as the first time. And imagine that, the one who didn't believe in the Son of God, the one that wanted to destroy the Son of God, if he could get his hands on Jesus, the one that wanted to destroy the whole mission, the whole mandate and the whole uh, uh, anthem of Jesus being the Son of God. He said, guess what? He's the Son of God. Let me tell you something, when you really get converted, when you really get touched by grace and touched by the Holy Spirit, your whole life will be about the Son of God. It'll always be about the Son of God. You'll preach about the Son of God. You'll talk about the Son of God. You'll live the Son of God. It'll just be part of your life. And remember, the Son of God title and statement was showing him as the Messiah. It was showing him as Lord. It was a very powerful statement, but Paul got it. He got it, man, and he was preaching Christ, and he said, this is, he is the Son of God. But all they that heard him were amazed. Wouldn't you think so? Let me give you the word, E-X-I-S-T-E-M-I. E-X-I-S-T-E-M-I. Exotema, 80, 1839, 1839. I gave you that word many times already in the book of Acts because that was what's happening. Everybody was what? Out of their mind. That's what it means. It means almost to go insane. <laughs> Picture it with me now. Here they are in Damascus. It would be like being in this room right here. We're in the synagogue hanging out. Next thing we know, Paul comes through the door. Al Capone, remember Al Capone? Or some other hit man or somebody we were worried about. Somebody they told us in town is going to come in and tear us up and drive us all out and, and, and skin us alive. All of a sudden, here he comes in. Jesus is the son of God. Amen. <laughs> That's the word that they use in the Greek that basically they were almost insane. It was almost out of one's mind. They couldn't believe it. They were amazed. Could you see that? I mean, what a, what a day, what an hour, what a powerful conversion and what a sense of humor God has. <laughs> to all of a sudden see Paul show up and he starts preaching Christ in the very synagogue, in the very city that everybody was told that this guy's fixing to destroy you and take you to jail. And now he's in the back or he's coming forward to preach. That would be a very awkward service, don't you think? Amen. If I got up here and I said, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Al Capone is here today to sing a song or what have you. You would look at me like, you're crazy. I'm out of here. I'm leaving. Okay. But watch it again. But all that heard were amazed and said, is this not he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priest? Again, this is, they didn't have TV. They didn't have cell phones. They didn't have texting. They didn't have this. They didn't have that. Word traveled from Jerusalem to Damascus that Paul was on his way to kill them, to put them in jail. And they had no idea that on that straight street, on that road, he was converted. Isn't that a cool? Isn't that amazing? But there he is. He comes in and he's preaching Christ. He's preaching that he's the son of God. And everybody knew who Paul was. Verse 22. And Paul increased the more in strength. Read that to yourself again. Paul increased the more in strength. You got to accept the call. You got to pursue the call. You got to protect the call. Paul increased. 
Now, I want to say this in passing right here because according to theologians and historians, we don't know exactly when Paul went to the, the desert of Arabia for three years, but they insert it somewhere in these passages that Paul had gone away for uh, the time to be with the Father. There's two trains of thoughts. Either he went to Arabia to preach or he went to Arabia to receive revelation or he did both. So just so you know that, and he talks about it in Galatians chapter one, verse 18. So Paul does give more explanation of his conversion and of his walk with God, okay? But having said that, regardless of Paul had already spent three years or not before his trip to Damascus, or in between that trip, because he did come back to Damascus, the point is this, that Paul increased. He increased, and that's what you and I should be doing. We should be increasing. So read it again, verse 22. But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which were at Damascus, proving that this very Christ, wow, he confounded them. He was already awesome at the law. Paul was already, like I said, he was under Gamaliel. He, uh, he was on his way to be a high priest. He was a, uh, he was a, a Jew and a Roman. He, uh, he had all kinds of, of, of just awesome backgrounds and pedigrees that would make him a phenomenal man of God in that realm of, of Judaism and the, the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees. He was a great, great scholar. But now here he was preaching Christ, preaching it and getting strength and then he starts, he starts uh, confounding them. In other words, the Jews couldn't say anything. You know what happened to Paul? As I said it in the beginning when we talked about Stephen and Paul was there. Remember I said that Paul probably was one of those guys who tried to contend with Stephen but could not because Stephen was full of the Holy Ghost. Paul was full of head knowledge. Now the roles reversed. Paul was full of the Spirit of God and he was defeating those with head knowledge. Amen. I, I would rather have uh, the spirit of God working in me with a little bit of knowledge than to have all the knowledge in the world and no spirit of God. There's no life in that, right? What, the spirit gives life, but the letter kills. The letter is a killer, okay? Which means just knowledge and, 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 and head stuff. All right, verse 23. And after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to what? Throw him a party. So awesome. Kill him. We don't know how many days he was in Damascus, but they had enough of them. I bet Paul was raising Cain all through up and down Damascus. I just picture him, and I'm only paraphrasing, he was burning stuff down. He was burning people's hind ends, religiously speaking. He was just blasting them. If he had a laser gun, he was probably just zapping them real good. I, I don't see Paul taking a break. I just see this wild dude running around, preaching the gospel, looking for a fight everywhere, uh, with contention according to the word of God. He wanted to contend. So guess what? They decided to kill him. Now notice what I said in the, in the other passage or the other uh, statement I made to you that Paul, he did so much damage to the name of Jesus. He did so much thanks to the name of Jesus. Now he was gonna receive much for that name. Now he who once was a hunter is now the hunted. You see that? That also tells you this that though you may be forgiven, there are still some things that will track you. You may be forgiven of certain things, but there are certain things that you, know, you have to deal with in your life. And Paul had to deal with that, okay? So they took counsel to kill him. That was, that was fast. That didn't take too long. Amen? Now, just imagine this, okay? Go back in your imagination. Here he is, he's, he, you know, he, he pulls into a hotel, turns on the television, and there it is, Damascus Most Wanted, and it's his picture. Goes to the post office box, it's his, his picture, you know? Just picture that, most wanted. All of a sudden, now he's, he's most wanted, they're gonna kill him. Verse 24, but they're laying a weight, but they're laying a weight was known of Saul, and they watched the gates both day and night to kill him. Again, use your imagination, Jason Bourne. James Bond, whatever, you know, the guy trying to get away and he's looking out and everybody's at the gate, you know, watching. Remember the gate was the central place in and out. It closed at night. It opened during the days where business was done. You could not get in and out of a city without going through the gate, technically. It was a stronghold. So here Paul now has the same feelings that the Christians have. 
Again, I think God has a sense of humor. Paul, you're going to do great things for me, son. But by the way, you're also going to go through a bunch of troubles. And I want you to know how it felt when you persecuted me. It doesn't feel good, does it? But I still love you, son. I'm going to take care of you. Don't you think that was part of Paul's training? I do. Absolutely, I do. God pressed him for a reason. Because God knew that Paul could do this. Paul, God knew Paul could handle this, that Saul could handle this thing. And so here he is, they're, <clears throat> they're laying at wait, they're at the gate, they're ready to kill him. He has no way out. Then the disciples took him by night and led him down by the wall in a basket. Now there's a lot of things to see here. Number one, Paul is a man of great faith. I love you guys, but I don't think I would trust too many of you to lay me down in a basket off a city wall. Don't look at me that way because you would have trouble me doing it too. But imagine that. He had to have faith in these brothers he just met. Remember, he wanted to kill them. You don't think that guy was letting it down thinking, <laughs> man, I tell you what, I could split this egg right open right here. Maybe he's not converted. Come on, think with me. These are things that are going on. But what was happening was a great bond was taking place between the disciples and Paul which was Saul. There was, there was a, a relationship that was taking place and Paul's faith was, faith was increasing and their faith is increasing. I think it was a very powerful testimony of them walking together. Verse 26, and Saul was come to Jerusalem. He attempted to join himself to disciples. So Paul leaves Damascus. He gets saved by the, the bucket brigade, the basket folks. They help him out and they get him out of there. Now he's in Jerusalem. Now remember, Paul is still considered an assassin. He's still considered a part of the posse. He's part of the, the you know, the, the, the priest, um, uh, the, the mob, the mafia, the whole nine yards. Uh, I, I'm looking for the words. He's, he, was, he was assigned to go do this. I think assassin is probably the better word, but that's what he was, he was going to do. Now watch, he's, he goes to join them. He attempted to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him. That makes me think about that basket one more time. Man of faith. Uh, no, I would trust you guys. You put me down in a basket. I don't know if the basket will hold me. That'd be the problem. <laughs> but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. So the word really didn't get back to Jerusalem as it did to Damascus. I mean, again, there's no way to communicate. There, you know, you don't, no texting, there's no way. So they weren't really sure of what Paul's intentions were. How many of y'all remember when you first got saved, people in the church kind of looked at you odd? Happened to me. They knew who I was. They knew the stuff I did and what have you. And then you get saved and they're like, mm-hmm, okay. <laughs> you know, they don't let you do anything in church. They watch you. He's going to fall. <laughs> you know, or something. He smells like smoke. Or whatever we went through. But this was the same issue for Paul. They didn't believe he was a disciple. He just preached Christ. He just mentioned the Son of God for the first time and demonstrated uh, the, the, the power of conversion to those in Damascus. Well, they didn't get the memo over in Jerusalem. So watch this. But Barnabas, everybody say Barnabas. Barnabas, you need to have a Barnabas in your life. You really do. You need a son of consolation. You need somebody that will vouch for you. You need somebody that will be there for you no matter hard, how hard the times are. You need a Barnabas, Okay. Every one of us needs somebody like that in our lives, Some, somebody that will vouch for us, okay? There's a, there's a reason for a Barnabas, and, and again, to have somebody vouch for you, but also none of us are an island unto ourselves, none of us. No matter where you are, no matter how high you are, president, bishop, whatever, nobody is beyond not having a, a, or needing a Barnabas in their life. So watch this, Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. Now the apostles there, uh, just to give you a clear understanding of it, is really was just uh, Peter and, and, and James. Peter and James, it wasn't the full team. It was just these two. And Paul speaks about that and it is in Galatians uh, as well. I believe it's in chapter one, verse 18, somewhere in there. So, so Paul goes and sees these two brothers, okay? 
and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So Paul gets to testify and say, hey man, I've preached this thing. I'm, 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 I'm converted. This is the real deal. And he was with them coming in and out, going uh, out of Jerusalem. They say about 15 days, I think he was. Galatians 1.18, again, it describes a lot of stuff. But he was about 15 days with them, okay? Making this, this bond, making this certainty, and, and making certain uh, that they understood where he was coming from. I mean, that was risky for Paul. That was risky for the apostles. You know, it's, again, it's like bringing bringing the bad guy into your hideout place or to your home, okay? The person who was assigned to destroy you, okay? All right, so where was that? Verse, uh, verse 29, and he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians. Now watch this, he disputed against who? The Grecians, Hellenistic. Remember who Stephen was from and who Philip was from. And I find that very funny. Again, here's God putting the apostle, who he's going to be an apostle, but he's putting Saul right here against the people to whom he crucified uh, of their own people, Stephen. And now he's having an issue with them. Paul is really being trained here. I don't know if you see the inside story. It's not just that he's preaching and he's got a call. He's being trained right here for world missions and what God is going to do. He had to go through this so he could be solidified as an apostle. He had to. You ever wonder why you go through so much trouble around the brethren, so much trouble in the beginning days of church and ministry and people rejected you and they blah, 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 they slandered and all that? All that was is to make you who you are today if you didn't let that define you. And you beat that. You beat that through acceptance and training and say, okay, God, that's okay. I know who I am. They don't know who I am, but you know who I am and I know who I am. And I see the promise of who I'm going to be. So I'm going to move forward. So Paul went there. He was beaten. He was battered. But one person, you know, one side of the coin will say, well, he deserved that. Well, you know, it's a little bit of sowing and reaping. But the reality is it made Paul who he was. Okay, so watch this as we close. Uh, and he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus, and disputed among the Grecians, but they were about to what? Slay him. They went to slay him. I think that's twice for now, isn't it? In just this short period of time, if you throw the three years into Arabia, so, you know, three years and change, he's been, they tried to kill him twice at least. Wow. Man, I, I can't win for losing. I go to Damascus to preach. You, kill, you want to kill me there. I come to Jerusalem. Nobody likes me. And then you want to kill me here. But that's all right. Watch what he says. And he spake bold in the name of Jesus. They went down the Grecians, the Grecians, but they wanted to slay him, verse 30, which when the brothers knew this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth really to his hometown, Tarsus. Notice the brothers saved his bacon again. You got to have brothers. You got to have sisters. They'll save your bacon. You got to love one another. You got to walk in, 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 in unity. You got to walk in friendship and fellowship, okay? You got to be a Barnabas. And then verse 31, uh, let me go back to verse 30. I, just, I have to say that it just amazes me again that here was this guy, he had an assignment to destroy them, he had an assignment to put them down, to take them out, and yet they were helping him. Wow. They had to have faith in him too, didn't they? Finally, verse 31, then had the churches rest. Really, it shouldn't be churches, it should be church. There wasn't churches yet. It's just the way it was uh, put in there, King James, and of course the way Luke made it plural was not plural, it was more just the church. But notice this, then the church had rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified. When did they have rest? When they got Paul out of there. He was even causing troubles being saved. Some of y'all cause trouble and you're born again, you mean thing you troublemaker they had rest because Paul has stopped persecuting but they also had rest because the America's most wanted or Damascus most wanted or Jerusalem most wanted was out of the way they were edified walking in the fear of the Lord in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied in other words the church began to grow the church began to grow 
Paul got out of the way. There was peace. There was comfort. And the church began to expand. And they had rest. Well, that rest ain't gonna last forever. You know that as we look at history. But that's an amazing testimony of the Apostle Paul, a mighty man of God. Again, you and I, we must... We must accept our calling from God. We must pursue that call and we must protect it. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this message tonight. I ask that you help us to apply these things in our lives today. And they can be and they will be. That Father, no matter what our past was, you sanctified us, you cleansed us and consecrated us to this day. And you'll use us, Father God. You'll use the skills that we have and the things that we have uh, have learned And you will bring us to a great place like you did the Apostle Paul. I believe that. I believe our greatest days are before us. Bless us, Father, the rest of this week. And look forward to ISM on Friday. Look forward to service on Sunday. Bless everybody that is uh, not here. And may you touch each and every one. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. I love you guys. I'll see you Friday or Sunday.